Hello everybody, it's Kevin here again and this week we're going to cover working with APIs using Postman. So why do we want to use this software, Postman, here? Well, we have a couple of options when we work with APIs. So we want, we typically want to send the request and we can send the request a couple of ways. So we can, the first way is we can use a tool like Postman here, which essentially all it does is it sends a request the same way that you would from any other, like from, from the terminal, for example, which we're going to cover as well. Uh, so that, that's, that's one option, right? The other option is, of course, using the terminal. And then the other option after that is sending the request from the client. So when we do, when, when, we, when we select one of these options, each one has its pros and its cons. Uh, of course, with Postman, this is, I'm currently in the uh, free environment, so it has a lot of functionality for the free environment uh, or the free plan, whatever they call it. Uh, and it, it's, it works quite well. And then with, uh, with curl, right, with the terminal, that is free and it's available without having to download anything on just about any any system right on Windows or Mac or Linux uh, so that's a that's a positive of course uh, when it gets a little bit more complicated as you will see with this authorized API that I have written here it becomes a little bit more difficult to start send, uh, to send these requests just to debug the API uh, and then of course the other option is to send the request from the client side so for example if we have an application like let's see here Let's look for a good example here. Let's say uh, GIMP, the graphical user, uh, graphical image processor. Let's say that makes an, uh, an API call to a server. Maybe in the source code, they're they're sending some they're sending some requests to an API that they wrote, or maybe that an API that they didn't write. And when they're when they were writing the logic, they had to know what that API was going to respond with, uh, the format, all that sort of stuff. So that's another option, right? You can play around with that and debug. Uh, debug it that way, but Postman, in my experience, is one of the better ways to uh, work with APIs. Of course, I'm not sponsored or anything from you know with Postman or anything. It's just it's a it's a cool tool and it's free, so I use it use it quite a bit. But let's kind of go over what you can use it for when working with an API. So this is an API that I demonstrated last week. It's the uh, authorization API where we can get customers and users and login and all that sort of fun stuff that you typically do with an API. So what I did is I started debugging here. So just run, start debugging. And I set a breakpoint right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to send a request. And without, I'll, I'll take that breakpoint away so you can see what it does. So if we want to send a request to this API, we can just pull up a command prompt. And we can do curl. And then I'll just paste, whoops. Go back to there. Send that request. There's an authorization problem though. Let's kind of look at the at the URL here. So this is the base portion of the URL. So it's uh, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And then the, uh, essentially what you would consider the website, right? The, do the domain and then the port. Because we're gonna, we gotta hit a specific port in order to uh, get to this API. And then the, uh, this would essentially be the equivalent of like a controller if you're working with C-sharp. Uh, prefix is another name for these here. And then finally, it's the actual endpoint, what your, what the final destination is where you're sending the request to. And as we can see here, it says authorization problem, which is what we would expect. We sent, we sent the request. We said, hey, send us all of the users. Uh, but we didn't say who we were. We didn't provide any sort of credential. It's kind of like trying to get into a location where you need to show identification and uh, you don't show ID and if there's someone enforcing that you're, you're not going to get more you're not going to get in more than likely so why don't we send a or why don't we set a, uh, a breakpoint here wherever it lets us set one and then I'll send that request and if we can if we look here we hit this breakpoint so we have a little bit of data here we have a request data which you can see here the there's the base URL HTTP version 1.1, original URL, auth, get users, which matches this. And we have a little bit of uh, other stuff here. So request.headers, we try to access it. So here's the headers. Uh, the user agent is curl. Hover over that again. So the user agent, uh, if you remember from last week, is platform specific information so whatever sent that request essentially that's that's where it came from so here it says hey it came from curl so we know that it didn't come from a phone or from from a website of course you can manipulate this and play around with that so it's not 
you, sh you shouldn't rely on it, but it it can serve as a pretty good metric if you're going to store that kind of to get an idea of like who's using your website, who's using your service, right? So if you're getting a bunch of calls from Safari and all of a sudden you're getting a bunch of users that are saying, hey, I, I'm having problems and you log what the user agent is and you see that most of them are users of Safari, well then you might know that it's a bug with Safari or it might be a lead, right? Your host is this here, so we, we see that that's within our headers and then accept that's what it accepts and then our authorization is undefined there's no authorization so we try to read that and we're not going to so we're gonna return an authorization problem so I'm just gonna continue we look at the response there authorization problem just as we'd expect so how about if we want to become authorized here so why don't we look at our login so login is a post route if we look back at the get users, that's a get route. So it changes a little bit. So if we go back to Postman, we can do this. We can do a login here. Click on this area and we'll see exactly what it does, right? So curl, location, request, let's type post. And then there's a URL and then the header, you set the header directly, content type, application, JSON, and then the data that you're passing in, the request body. And here's what you're passing in. So you can do all of this via via curl as well. This is also an option. And okay. It has to, it's it's gonna be a multi line, so why don't we start working with it manually here? So you can skip ahead if you don't want to watch me type all this stuff out. I wonder if this is an end of line. I never use that. We'll leave it and then we'll go back. So I'm just showing essentially what you would be doing if you didn't have Postman set up. Must have started a new line here, which is perfect. There's the payload that we're going to send. Oh, that's a multi-liner, so we're not going to do that. And I'm going to do a single quote here so we don't end up accidentally escaping. Okay, looks like it didn't like that. I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up first so that you, you guys don't have to watch me struggle here. So, the terminal was being kind of problematic, so all I did was I switched over to git bash, copied it directly, and pasted it here. There's a request. So there's our token, there's the data that we got back. So, now we would have to form the request for the get users, right? So we would have to go here, and send it this way. It's kind of clear how it can be a little tedious, as you can tell there, especially if you don't have something generating the request for you. So, kind of, that's 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 all I was trying to prove how tedious it can be. So, let's kind of go over how we can use it now. And I have some notes here just to make sure I don't get ahead of myself. But basically, we want to log in. So all we would have to do is we would have to send the request, and we have a lot of we have a lot of options here. So. Number one, we have our parameters, and uh, actually, before we even get into that, let's get into the the uh, requests that we can send, the methods. So we have a get, post, put, patch, delete, copy, so on and so forth. We have all of these here. I already mentioned before in the last uh, lecture video that I prefer get and post typically, but they have their uses, so be aware that they exist. And then we have our parameters, right? And I mean, I should mention, of course, 
you haven't used this before, we have our our address bar here. So that's where we were. We would enter our address that we want to go to. You know, you might notice these here. So these are variables that we can use. I'm not going to get into those quite yet. Just kind of go over the basic operation here. So we have our query string parameters. If we try to set some query string parameters, we can say Doge here and a value of coin, and it automatically formats them. It's pretty, pretty useful. Typically, you use that with GET requests. However, if you look at the logic here, just like most other uh, programming languages that you uh, write APIs with, you can access the request body, wh whether you're inside of the post or in a GET route, either ways. But it, it, it's typically convention to stick to the request body if you're using a post route, and typically convention to stick with query string parameters if, you, if you're using a GET route. So that was our query string parameters we have our authorization so we have a couple options we can do OAuth we can do bearer token which is what we're gonna use quite a bit in this here course and then we have all these other items here that we can use they don't really apply to the course but we be aware that they exist because you might use them in industry then we have our headers which we can set so we could set a header of again doge and coin and that would be sent so if we look here Here's that header that we set directly. We're not going to use that, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. Remove it here too. We have the request body, which is what we're actually sending, like the, the payload that we're sending. So we have a couple options here. We can do none. We can do form data. We can do URL encoded, which I've used before in industry. Raw, which is you have a couple options. You can either do XML. So extensive markup language, you can do HTML, you can do JSON, JavaScript, or text. I'm going to stick to JSON because that's what the API that I wrote is uh, using. Of course, we have binary, we have GraphQL. We're not going to work with any of these, but we're aware that they exist. We have our pre-request scripts, which we're going to look into the documentation in a little bit as to what they do. But basically, it's a script that you run before the request even starts and tests. I love the tests. This is what I use extensively. And that's because this is what you do with the data that you get back. And you can store it in variables. You can do actual tests, as you can see here. And we have our settings, which as as they uh, exactly what they say is what they do, basically. SSL verification, HTTP method, authorization header, so on and so forth. So you can set all of your stuff here. It's pretty useful. So let's kind of get into variables right away because that's a, that's a big one. And with variables comes uh, environments. So you have a couple, you, you have different levels, you have different scope, right, with, with each variable. So typically the convention with variables is this, where you use the two uh, curly brackets and then the variable name. So if we hover over the variable and there's something set, we can see the variable. See if I can move it down. I'm not even going to try to move down into it. But if we look at that first item right there, initial, that's the initial value. Current is what we set it to, so the current value. And scope is the environment. So it's this is the environment. And this is where we can select our environment. So what do we use variables for? We use variables for anything that might change, just like in, in any other application. So essentially, if we like our token that we're using to send a request, that changes after each login request because we generate a new token. So that's an area where we might use a variable. The base URI, we we don't have to use a variable. I like to use one personally because you might have a development base URI. You might also have a you know, like production test URI where it's like out in production, but it's not with uh, actual production data. So that's where you can start testing your application against what like an endpoint that's out there, not running locally on your machine. It's, it kind of gets into the whole, oh, it works uh, in localhost, but not in the server. Yeah, well, then that's how you would essentially kind of get away from that. And, of course, you can have your production URL. So that's where that's where it can be useful. In this case, we only have one URI. Uh, so I just used it for, just to kind of prove the point. So where do we set them? Well, it depends on the, it, it depends on the uh, scope. So if we click here. This is our collection, which I'll get into in a little bit. And if we look over here, we have variables. So I don't have any collection level variables because I don't, I guess I just didn't choose to use them. If you wanted to use one though, you would just create
create it right here. So for example, we could say, let's say name, initial value, test, current value, we're not gonna set that. And then we could access that throughout the rest of the API or the rest of the collection. So if I go into params and say, pass in a name here, we do name, and if you go back over here, yeah. It's gonna say unresolved variable, but uh, that's because we haven't actually assigned anything, to, even though it says initial value. So that's one option. The other option is our environment variables. So let's go back, get rid of this here. We could also define name and environments. So we have a couple options. We have our defined environment. So CMSC 2204 API, that's one environment. And here's some of the variables that I use. So if I set name here, I, I suppose I have to save as well, right? That's probably why it didn't work earlier. And there we go. There's our name. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this because we don't we don't need that. And our globals just as they just as it sounds they're global to the entire to like all of the collections. So just think of any instance where you might use a global variable and that's when you would use it. So basically not often because you don't want to use global variables too often. It's very it's quite niche, right? So you don't want to use them for, you don't want to use global variables. You don't want to overuse them. I should say that's the proper term. If you're wondering, it's because of uh, data consistency. So you're trying to access it in one area and then maybe another area of the application tries to access it. So that's, and then you end up with an instance where you can run into like semaphore problems essentially. If you're not familiar with it, look into it. It's uh, like a computer science concept. Uh, good very a good video for that is uh, spanning tree so spanning tree is the channel so you just look up spanning tree semaphores it's a great example of how they work and what they are so kind of went over our environments we can create new environments and import environments not going to go over the import because I don't have one to import but you would you would have to have somebody else generate one or you could generate one as a backup and then import that our collections, just as they sound, our collections of API calls. So if we look here, CMS, or just 2204 assignment six payloads, that's the collection. Uh, 2240 uh, assignment seven API payloads, that's the collection of API calls. You can create folders, so just right click, add a folder, add a request, rename, export, delete, have a couple options there. You can also import in this area. So if you have one PC that has one collection that you want to use or you want to share it within an, a development environment you can go ahead and just export and then have that other user import uh, the prefer the preferred method is to like create an account a free account basically and you can save all your data through that and then you just whenever you log in you can share it and then you can have a at this point up to three users under a free account where you all share the same uh, collections and everything so it's quite useful so Let's get back to login. We're gonna send this login request. You look over here, it did some stuff. We have some logging, which I believe is not related to this recent, uh, let's try setting it again. Yeah, that's not related to that. Must've been from a call that I tried making via the command prompt terminal. So, if we look here, we get some data back. So we got a success, which has a Boolean value of true. We have a variable data, which is uh, essentially JSON inside of, uh, what do you call it, uh, a parameter. So if we look at how we define those over here, this is our login. It says right here, we set a user ID to, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is where I'm signing. So forget about that. So this is where we set them. So success is equal to true. We're, we're just converting this to JSON. Some, some variable success is being set to true. Uh, some object data with properties user ID, email, and token are being set to the following uh, values that we use within here. Uh, so this, 
this over here in Postman is the the result of that essentially. So how do we use this? Well, this is our token that we want to use with our other calls. So we can use tests. And now we can get into personally I I love this. I know a lot of newer developers hate it, but it's the doc, it's the documentation. It tells you exactly what everything does. So if we look at environment variables, it'll go over all of the environment uh, related stuff. You're gonna see this here PM, the Postman object. So you got you have to get used to that. That's essentially what you use within Postman. So if we go here and we say let body, we're just assigning this to some variable body that we're defining, and PM is Postman dot response is a property of Postman, and then we're just setting it to JSON. So it's it's pretty self-explanatory. We're taking the response. We're taking the JSON and we're assigning it to body, and that's the uh, response body. If we do console.log body here, and we get our console out, we send this request, we'll see the log. I think you can do a console.table here. Oh, it doesn't like it. I'm actually going to go look at the documentation because if we can use a console.table here, that'd be quite useful. So it looks like we don't have access to console.table. This is something that you can use. It's quite useful. So like if you inspect element and you do a console.table here. Oh. Come on, come back up. All right, not going to worry about it. But essentially, if you do a console.table there and you pass in an object that you want to log, that's how you would display it. So let's get back to this. Console log. So that's the variable that, we, that we're using here. I'm going to get rid of that. If we look at the documentation again here, Look at environment variables. We can we can do uh, postman dot environment dot has and a variable name, and it's just going to return a true or a false. So programmatically, you can check whether variables are set, whether they exist. Uh, we can set variables. We can get variables, and we can replace values inside of variables. So we have quite a quite a few options here, but the most common ones that we're going to use here are set and get. So we have our variable token that we have defined in our environment. So token is right here, no initial value. If we go back to our login, we do a postman.environment.set. And what are we setting it to? We're setting it to body, which is the entire body, dot data. So uh, this attribute, this variable of the whole body, and then of data, we're accessing token. So when we access that directly, we can see the token. So if I do like, for example, here a console.log body.data.token, you pull up the console here, send that request, here's our token. So we set that value and now we can use it. And of course you can do tests as well, just as the name implies. A lot of people misinterpret what tests are for. They might think they, they some people think that tests are just for uh, doing your typical tests like oh we're gonna expect this data type or th the data in this format and if it doesn't come in that format well our application is gonna break so it's better to catch it in here and yes that's a that's a popular and really good use of tests but this is also another really good area where you can use tests because it runs after the request has been made and after you get the response as well so we have our token, we assigned it to that value, and then we do here a postman.expect. So let's go back to the documentation, and if we look, postman.expect. Go to the docs here. Oh. And it tells you how to use that basically so it gives you examples so for example right here we expect the response to have a property 
code of 200 so a 200 status code a 200 status code which means okay in this case we expect the token to not be undefined so let's try that so we, we look at our test here and we passed our test the token was defined if we pass in some junk data here send that request there was a problem so there must have been a problem with uh, serialization and deserialization why don't we fix this right now actually verify credentials whoops we're gonna try this and we're gonna catch an error yeah I'm not gonna get super into the de into the weeds here we could fix it but you could do that on your own working with uh, JavaScript but essentially you can ch test whether stuff passes or if it doesn't pass. In this case, it clearly didn't pass. It actually broke. So let's try sending a good request again, though. Tests pass, and when we send a request, we have access to quite a bit of quite 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 a few things here. So we have a, um, access to the body, which was returned. We can see that in JSON pretty print format. We can see it in the raw format. Preview and visualize. I never use those but be aware that they exist. Cookies, we don't use any cookies. Uh, if you set any, or if it returns any cookies, you can access them the, uh, that way. Headers, we can see what was returned. Test results. And then we have a couple other items here. So we have our response. Postman's pretty useful because it shows you what each code actually means. The time that it took to uh, send the request. So if we look here, we have our socket initialization. DNS lookup, TCP handshake, transfer start, and download. And it gives us a total. We have the size, tells us the size of everything. And we have the option to save the response. So we want to use the token later on now. So what we do is if we look here in authorization, we don't we don't have any authorization in here because we're not we, we don't need any authorization to send the login request. It's like a chicken and an egg problem, right? You need to be able to log in first. So if we go to get users and we go to authorization, we might we're gonna notice here that we access a value, a variable token, and it's set to what we set it in login inside of that test. And we set the type right here to bearer token. So if we change this type, we can access that. Or we can see how that changes right here via the header. So API key. No authorization. OAuth one. See if that'll reload. Might have to set some more. Yeah, we have to set some other stuff there. But as we start setting stuff, we'll see more stuff in the curl request. But we want to use bearer token, and we have what the request is actually going to be. So we set a header to auth. We ha we set a header of authorization to uh, bearer, and then the value of the bearer token. Bearer, not bear. So we're not going to pass anything in. We're just going to say, hey, send us all of the users. And we send that request. Look at the body. And here's all of our users. Let's say we don't have any authorization. Send that request. There's an authorization problem. So. Let's see if I have anything else that I got to really cover. That's important. Pre-request scripts. Uh, that's a script that runs before the before you send the request. So if you have to set any stuff before you send the request, you can do it here. I'm not. I don't use them extensively, but they exist. Be aware, basically. And if we go back here, I just want to cover everything, all of the necessary items before I demonstrate how you would work with a brand new API that you've never worked with. Environments, terminology, so kind of covered that last week as well. Collections, variables, yep. So all this looks pretty good. So what do we do when we have a new API that we have to work with? So for you, the student or the individual that's watching this video, this is the API that we're working with in the application, the mobile app that we're going to write. This API is not well documented it's just something that I spun up quickly just to uh, use with the app that has authorization and such but 
If you're accessing a public API, typically they have some level of documentation. This one doesn't, it's not a public API. Uh, not a good example, but we will have some that are good examples over here. So essentially you have to be aware of the routes that you can call. So yeah, you could look through the source code and see all the routes that exist and what they do, but that's tedious and you might not have access to that source code. Like let's say you want to send a request to like a NASDAQ API just to get financial data. You're probably not going to have access to the source code. So how the heck do I know where to send the request? Well, it's the API documentation. So if we go over here, there's this endpoint in this API called the fake store API. Now there's a couple fake APIs, or not fake, but a couple public APIs that we can use. Uh, some of them have tokens that we that we have to pass in, other ones don't. This fake store API doesn't require anything, but it's a pretty good representation of, of what an API that you're going to work with is going to look like. So typically this is what API documentation is. Here's one that I use regularly. So if I do the App Store, Apple App Store API. This one I use regularly. So Basically, uh, in the pipelines that I use at work, we have pipelines to automate uh, taking, building an application, taking the the, the end result, so an, a, an IPA file at this at this point, uh, an IPA file that's going to be published to the App Store, and uh, we just use an API to send that file over to the App Store. So if we look here, let's say we want to create an API key. Well, here's the overview of how to create an API key. So, kind of tells you how that works. Let's say we want to register a new device with the API. It'll tell you the URL. It'll tell you the what the method is. So, post. Here's the here's the endpoint essentially. What the body expects. So, application JSON and the response goes that could potentially be returned here. List devices is another one that we could use, and this one this one's a get route, takes in query string parameters, and here's some response codes. One that I use quite a bit is publishing. See if I can find that one. It's kind of a one and done type thing. Once you write it, you don't really look at it again. But let's see here. I'm sure this is boring for you guys to watch me search for the route that I, or for the the endpoint that I make calls to, but yeah, basically this is what it's like. So this is what the documentation looks like. This is what good documentation looks like. For example, uh, here's some essentials of how you can generate a token, how you can revoke an API key, rate limits. These are all super important things if you're making a bunch of calls to an API. So. Going back to the fake store API, kind of gets you, uh, kind of gets you used to what the API reference would look like. So, say we want to get all products. Well, let's first let's look at the overview. It's just a, a fake JSON, you know, JSON format API that returns data, and yeah, that's that's about it. So this is the overview for that. It's not like Apple, right, where it's a lot more complicated, but kind of gets you uh, in that mentality of how it works. So say we want to get all products. Why don't we try sending this via curl? There's our data. So this we can't really read. We can do pretty print. You know, we can we can do stuff to get this printed in a more neat way. But why do that when we have Postman? So. Here is our base URL. So say you wanted say you wanted to create a new environment here, we would do or a new collection I mean. We'd create a new collection, call this the fake API. Let's add a request to it. Let's call this get what is this here? Get products. Here's the URL. Sorry, that's not it. Here's the URL. 
send that request and here we go here's all of our products that we get returned that we that we see after we send that call so if you if, if you've made it this far and you're still uh, wondering how this could be used we could access all of these properties within our mobile application and display them on screen so for example if you have an e-commerce application and you want to display the the items that you have available so that the user could go and uh, maybe place an order go shopping have a shopping cart and all that sort of stuff here's how you would this is how you would transmit and how you would uh, access the data essentially of course we're not going to cover serialization and deserial deserialization quite yet but just be aware that this is the raw data that we're sending between the API and the uh, client so yeah here's the here's all that interesting stuff see if we can access this so yeah that's what we would that's what we would see in one second okay so that's where we get all of our products get a single product this is where we can make it a little bit more complex so you can go back to postman here add a new route or add a new request call this request get product by ID and rather than passing it in that way actually now that I think about it it doesn't take it in as a query string parameter does it that's a little strange to s okay so here's a query string parameter but I guess that's the way that this one handles it so we're just gonna send one that's product one two product two of course we can set something up to pass in any number here I'm not gonna do that right now this is not common convention by the way to do stuff like that at least not in my experience let's create a new request here see if there's any post post routes that we can send Okay, so remember that nothing in real, well, that's not very good in grammar, is it? Will be inserted into the database. Yeah. But this is an example of how we would post something. So let's say we want to add a new product. We would go here. We would say post request. Call this add new product. Do you see the. Uh, similarities between this uh, this API that we are going to work with here in the class and the one that the fake API it's create read update deletes essentially so you create the lo create a login so create a user add a user which I guess creation uh, delete a user get users so create read update delete so if we want to add a new product we can save this and now it's a post route go to the body we're going to set it to raw, JSON, and this here is a JSON that we want to pass in. Now this is invalid JSON, so we're going to have to clean it up a little bit. Again, I apologize if this is um, not super interesting to watch. You can go ahead and go ahead and skip ahead if you'd like. We have a parse error, expected comma. There's an extra comma in here. Save that, send that request, and looks like we had a 200 OK. Now, personally, if I wrote this API, 
I wouldn't return a 200 okay. I'd return a 201 created, but this is what they returned, so that's fine, I suppose. Here are the headers. So that's an example of where we would use that. Let's go back to the an actual instance where we could go and create new stuff. Let's do create customer. Well, first let's do our get customers. So I don't think I actually, yeah. Let's go back, yeah, I don't wanna mess that up. Got our customers. Here's an example customer. Let's create a customer. Send that request. Okay, there was an authorization problem. Let me make sure. Yeah, so that does exist. So there's no authorization. So we're going to want to add that. Save that. Try sending that request. Created a customer. Get customers again. See if it did create it. And there we go. Here's the customer that we created. We want to get a customer by ID. We could add a route for that. But essentially, this is what it's just mimicking create read update. I shouldn't say mimicking because in this one, we're not mimicking. This one is mimicking the fake API. But this is how you would, this is essentially how you would work with that. I understand that this is tedious to watch, but it's real world. This is how you would. Uh, work with Postman and this is how you would work with a new API typically. Update a product. So looks like we looks like it expects a put method. This one expected a post. So you get the you get the point though. This is how that's essentially how you would do that. If you wanted to use any variables, again you can define them to an environment specific to this. You could define them in the collection variables. So that's about it. Just uh, the biggest thing that you should pull, that you should take away from this, this lecture, this video, is that number one, you want to have an API reference, so you want to have some method of knowing what you have available. Uh, the other thing is you have to, and it comes with the API reference, but you got to know what it expects. So if you're going to send data, you have to know what exactly is expected. So you got to know whether or not it expects a uh, bearer token you got to know whether or not you have to set additional headers which sometimes you have to depending on the API uh, got to know whether it's the, the, the type of request so again this is all this all comes from the API reference so that's really important to have that API reference have some sort of way to know, you know what the deal is uh, the other option of course is to have access to the source code which you all do this is available in github it's, uh, my username in GitHub is KYGM, and I have the repository for this listed in the previous video. But that's about it, basically. Just get get used to Postman, use it, use it to your advantage, and uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for watching.